had ridden into town in the identical truck, the white Dodge Carry-On, same year, it was probably 1965, and parked on the same road that we parked on along the water, not in the alley, and they curiously decided to bust him and look into what he had in his truck, and it was loaded with kilos of marijuana. It was the biggest drug bust in Puerto Vallarta's history. Apparently, hashtag van life and hippies were all too common in Mexico in the 70s, leading to a classic case of mistaken identity. Joanna and Jeffrey's van, so thoughtfully decorated with hand-sewn curtains, was identical to another hippie's, who, unfortunately for Joanna and Jeffrey, was a huge pot smuggler. And the federales of Puerto Vallarta assumed that all hippies with matching vans were part of that same pot smuggling ring. Now, the local jail was a surprisingly pleasant place. But hanging over Joanna's head was the prospect of a conviction that would send her boyfriend to prison in Guadalajara, a hellhole in which Jeffrey would probably die, according to almost everyone. She calls the consulate official. And he's like, okay, the arraignment is going to be probably next week, and you're going to be in a courtroom, and there's going to be a judge. And you have to come up with a good story why Jeffrey punched a policeman. This is what you should tell him. You tell him that Jeffrey is the son of a senator. And he has, he's mentally ill. And he was causing a lot of trouble in the States. And the family asked you to take him out of the country to Mexico. And that's why he acted this way. He's mentally ill. And he... You know, he would never, you know, no one, no one in their right mind would ever punch a Mexican policeman. Please allow us to leave and I will take him out of Puerto Vallarta and we are so sorry that we, you know, insulted the police by this action. And how much money do you have, by the way? So I said, a couple thousand dollars. He said, well... He said, I think about $1,000 will do it. So he said, after you tell the judge this, you take the envelope with the money and you push it towards the judge on the table discreetly and you say, please, uh, we are so sorry we caused all this trouble and we hope that this will compensate for all this trouble that we have caused the town. With a Spanish-English dictionary, Joanna writes a monologue. Now, luckily, she's an actress, and she knows this will be her most important role ever. The day comes, and they bring in Jeffrey, who is now looking very thin and very sad, and you know, he knows he's facing 20 years in the penal. This is not good. And so I, you know, his case is called and I stand up in front of the big desk in front of the, and I, I deliver my speech, you know, in Spanish. Please forgive him. He didn't know what he was doing. He is not in his right mind. He, you know, he's had this problem before. He has hit other people, not, you know. You know, I even surprised myself. I'm clasping my hands. I'm raising them in supplication to the judge. I'm pointing to Jeffrey, which we had planned before. And I was like, when I get to the part of please forgive him and let him go, I'm going to point to you and you are going to get down on your knees on the floor and you are going to beg like this, please let me go. So I'm crying. I literally have thrown myself into this performance. Tears are streaming down my face. He's crying. This drama is going on. The judge is looking very stern. And he was like, okay, enough, enough, enough. I I will reconsider, I will reconsider. And this is a very serious offense. And I could give him 20 years in the penal. But because of the special circumstances, and I'm thinking, you know, and I have slipped him the money as well as with the pleading. 
And I'm thinking, okay, it's done. I paid the money. I gave the apology. Instead of giving him 20 years in the penal, I will only give him five. Well, then I really started crying because I knew, according to the, uh, you know, the consul, like, he's not going to survive a year in the penal. So I'm like, please, no, don't you, he'll never last there. It's so terrible. This was real. This was not an act. So we, oh, okay, okay, all right, all right. I will change, I will change the sentence. I will allow you to be on probation. And you must take him out of Puerto Vallarta by sunset. And you may never return to Puerto Vallarta again. <laughs> so we're like, we really, it was like a reprieve. Like, thank you, thank you, thank you. We walk out of this courtroom. We go back to the hotel. <laughs> We pack my few things. We drive out of town. We're still shaking. We park about 10, 20 miles north of Puerto Vallarta. We're out of town by sunset. We're not in Puerto Vallarta city limits. And we realize that he just escaped, probably dying in a prison in Mexico. Fifty years after this debacle, Joanna told me about a phone call she had with her daughter, my best friend, who was in Puerto Vallarta on vacation, telling Joanna about how nice it was. Joanna said it sounded like a good time, but she can never, ever return there, even after half a century. She and Bob vacation in Cape Cod. Joanna's story is cautionary. Reminding one to stay sober while traveling in countries with strict drug laws, and attempt to maintain and attempt to maintain a moderately tidy, not total hippie appearance while abroad, because many humans do judge a book by its cover. And finally, we learn once again that in Mexico, it's a good idea to keep money on hand for police bribes, as Far Out story also illustrated. Hippies, also known as freethinkers or outside-the-box existers, were under attack from the corporate traditionalists at the top, trying to maintain order, their theoretical fingers bloody, trying to retain control amidst the uncontrollable chaos of the universe. Hmm, sound familiar? Yeah, it's a reoccurring pattern in human history. And reminds me once again that I am a fucking hippie. I'm Rainbow Valentine, and this is Disorganized Crime Smuggler's Daughter. Stay safe out there and be kind to each other. Disorganized Crime Smuggler's Daughter is written and recorded by me, Rainbow Valentine. Our producers are Gabby Watts and Taylor Church. Executive producers are Brandon Barr, Brian Lavin, Elsie Crowley, and me at School of Humans, and Connell Byrne and Charles Bryant at iHeartRadio. Our music is by Gabby Lala and Claire Campbell, with original theme by Mark Karen and me. You can follow us online at disorganizedcrimepodcast.com. Writing our own story, doing as we please. Tamil pies, sleeping princess of the red Helps us keep it real A handshake seals the deal Grab the stash, seal the meal And load up these old wheels Rolling a doobie Young, rich, and groovy Make it up as we roll along Rolling along Far out country road In order to create change, you have to get uncomfortable. Join The Breakfast Club for a special conversation with conservative radio host Rush Limbaugh. Why are we having this conversation with someone whose historical viewpoints differ so significantly from ours and who we represent? Because the dialogue has to be open beyond who we know 
or who we talk to every morning. Listen to The Breakfast Club on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.